was Walter Lewin. 45. 0.6. Plus or minus 0.1 seconds. Physics works, I'm telling you. Well, there are two ways to teach physics. How many prefer number one? I didn't think so. So what you just saw is Walter Lewin's, uh, uh, one of his lectures, parts of one of his lectures. Uh, 100 of his video lectures are up on MIT OpenCourseWare, available to the world for free. Uh, there's Walter Lewin uh, in Jordan after we showed that video to Her Majesty Queen Rania, and she said, I want that person to come visit Jordan. So he did. So Blossoms is designed pedagogically to run in harmony with the high school teacher. And it's basically aimed at critical thinking skills, creative thinking, lateral thinking, learning for life, and taking uh, advancement in careers in engineering and science. It's basically, the idea is a teaching duet. The videos go for three or four minutes. They fade the black. The in-class teacher then take over the takes over the class in a very interactive session, achieving a learning objective in the next four or five minutes. And then after they do that, they go to the next video segment. And so in a 50-minute class, a 60-minute class, it goes off and on like this. This is not a video that the students will watch for 50 minutes and fall asleep after eight minutes. This is the video they'll watch for three or four minutes, fades to black, and then the teacher takes over and is a highly interactive class. And Rana showed some of that in her presentation. Here are the countries so far. Uh, we haven't put Saudi Arabia there because that's not official yet. So in, the, in addition to the U.S., we have Jordan, Pakistan, and now Lebanon, and uh, we visited... Dr. Larson? Yes. What, 30 more seconds? One more minute. One more minute. And those are the states in the United States. And so we want to find the best way to excite young people. We welcome your contributions. And I'm going to close with this. The moment of inertia will increase, so her angular velocity will decrease. And as the ice skater brings her arms in, the moment of inertia will go down and therefore her angular velocity will increase. Could they start in one part of the city, walk around in such a way that they cross all the bridges exactly once, not more, not less? This is called donkey cart physics, filmed in the streets of Lahore, Pakistan. There are no brakes in a donkey cart, but there are red lights. I'm going to roll the die. Roots can also store a lot of glucose as starch right here. So this is my contribution to the world here. wear this red hat and be an infected and infectious person. Hello everyone, my name is Newton. Now, here's the challenge for you. For a final exercise, we're actually going to be constructing Thomas Jefferson's wheel cipher. We are eukaryotes because as humans, we have nuclei in our cells where our DNA is kept. We'll be back for one more minute at the end. See you soon. One adult human being has a hundred trillion cells. What's that over there? What's what? That, that right side. Right I don't know. So long, everyone. Thanks for staying with us. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lotte. We'll take uh, a few questions now. Uh, we're going to have only three questions. And please, uh, I beg you to keep them as questions and not opinion or commentaries or just or speeches or your presentation. Uh, who has a question? OK, let's start here in the middle. Thank you very much for the, this session. Actually, my question directed to the first speaker, and I'd like to thank you very much for the whole the recommendation and advice is being given uh, to our part, uh, and I hope all these recommendations will be taken into consideration. 
My question is, how do you perceive the awareness about the entrepreneurial among us this part of the world? I'm just saying that because as a part of my work with the job seeker in the career education program, I'm asking them, what do you like to do in the future? And what kind of work would you like to do? Most of them, they are choosing to work with the public sector, with the government. A few of them, they are considering to work with the private sector. None of them considering to be a self-employed or they became their own boss. From your experience, what can you do for, what, what, what recommendation can be given to, the, to, to, to Arab country practically to draw the roadmap or the implementation which can reflect on their decision. Thank you. So I guess that was addressed to me. Um, China is a good example because China, um, 20 years ago, we were just having a conversation, did not have an entrepreneurial um, society. The culture actually ran counter to entrepreneurialism. And today, it's becoming a hotbed. And what happened was, as the economy developed, and as young people entered the workforce and rose to the middle levels, gained skills, and looked around the world and saw people like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the founder of Facebook, make $30 billion, or whatever his share is, um, they began to believe that it was possible, and they're now beginning to, to undergo an entrepreneurial renaissance in, in China. I think it's gradual. Um, I think that success causes other success, and I think it's viral, and I think that um, it takes encouragement, because I think if you're a young person, to have the bravery to launch your own business without the kind of support structure uh, from your family, from your, co from your neighborhood, from your city, from, from your school is very frightening. But some of them will do it anyway. I've already met some of the kids here who they told me, I don't care, I'm going to do it. So I think over time, I think you'll see successes breed success. Entrepreneurialism is the way of the world going forward. Uh, it's a way to compete and quite honestly with, with Facebook, with everything else going on, um, we can fight to keep cultures very pure and very, and very separated, but it just frankly isn't going to happen. So I think entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism uh, is, can either be viewed as a disease or it can be viewed as a wonderful, wonderful, contagious spirit. So I, I, I really think that that, that that is the probability, if I were to predict. Uh, we have two more questions. Afonte, there is one here and one here. And this is the only question we're taking for this session. The next question, please. Hello. My question is addressed to Mr. Raj. He just mentioned that don't afraid of China and India as they are vulnerable. Briefly, in what sense are vulnerable? Because at least um, in the Middle East, it seems that the vision of Iraq is somehow as a, a vendetta to co contain, it's uh, as part of the containment policy of China, is going to Iraq, the source of energy on the, the Gulf area, where the, all the American forces are present there just to to prevent the Chinese from coming or to control the source of energy, the petrodollar, etc. How vulnerable are China and India? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, well, on China's vulnerabilities, uh, its one-child policy uh, has created a gender imbalance and a great deal of social upheaval. Uh, through sex-selective abortions and female infanticides, China's got a great uh, imbalance in its gender population. And the one-child limit is now leading to China becoming, uh, going through a transformation to one of the youngest countries to the one, of, one of the oldest countries. And, and we're seeing that now in manufacturing wage costs going up 
so that many country, many companies are actually leaving China and going for, to cheaper platforms like Vietnam. Um, a second vulnerability uh, is human rights. Uh, we've all seen uh, the reaction of the Chinese Communist Party to the Nobel Prize being awarded to Liao Xiaobo. Uh, and we've talked here in this conference about uh, the importance of human rights, women's rights, uh, in creating an entrepreneurial and creative spirit. Uh, and um, China doesn't yet have that. Um, a third vulnerability is gross income inequality. The Gini coefficients, the, one of the standard measures of income inequality uh, by economists, have, have gotten much worse in China. It's actually a more unequal society uh, than India and is approaching uh, the levels which are the highest in the world uh, of Latin America. Uh, corruption. It's, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, just to make a very make broad brush, there's a lot of corruption, transparency, international scores China at just 3.5 on a scale of 1 to 10, with um, zero being highly corrupt. So the, worse, the lower the score, the worse you are. And um, it's got vulnerabilities on defense. Um, on its, on its, it, it's, it's not, it does not have the capabilities to project power militarily across three uh, across the oceans the Atlantic the Pacific the Indian Ocean um, it doesn't have the Air Force capability to do it um, India's very briefly infrastructure decrepit uh, caste system the Hindu caste system uh, really constrains six seven hundred million people um, uh, corruption uh, it scores uh, at three point three um, and it's got defense vulnerabilities. It's pinned down in Kashmir. And what's little known is it actually loses a huge number of resources and people through its own internal insurgency battle with the Naxalites, the Maoist insurgency. These are all uh, um, vulnerabilities of these two countries. And, and there, there are others, but there's a, there's a catalog of them. So I wouldn't, the big message is, is, get, is you get the point, is, is don't be intimidated by them. It's still an open game. I missed, sorry. The how, how powerful the Arab countries are? Uh, creativity, uh, dynamism, uh, a good climate. You're, you're, not in a, you're not in a geographic region like Bangladesh. Um, uh, a grand tradition that we spoke about earlier, and I only mentioned the, the legal tradition. Um, diversity, got tremendous diversity. Those are five just like that. Thank you. I would like to take the last question here in the front. Yes. Uh, I have two questions, sorry. <laughs> two questions, no. You two can take one. It's unfair because there are so many people okay. who, who have questions too. One question. All right. Uh, one question, it would be to Mr. Donald. It's about, and it, it relates also to social entrepreneurship. It's about the sense of turning, returning back to society. I don't think that youth in the Arab world have a choice. They don't even return back. They don't have a choice but to go to social entrepreneurship because there is so much competition in the job uh, market and they don't have the choice or the job that they are looking for. So they go to this field. The problem really is about uh, the capital money taking risk. In, in, in the U.S., in, in England, there are angels, there are uh, structures that, uh, uh, that allow young people to have their ideas uh, happen. Uh, Steve Jobs, Apple, happened like that because right. there was this kind of, of uh, structures. Uh, do you believe that how can we uh, make capitalists in the Arab world risk their money more? Very, very, tough, very tough question. Um, I'll give you what I think might be a controversial answer to that. Um, I believe that uh, what I said about building an academy and building um, a structured system to, to encourage entrepreneurialism is a must. The growth of the economy in the Arab world long term will not be in oil. I, I, I believe, this is my own personal opinion, I'm not a petroleum expert, but I believe that there may be 20 years of value in oil. 
Because with all the hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars being put into alternative energy, much of which I think I would hope would come from this region to build new economies and new technologies, um, really uh, forces the region to look to other building other economies. And uh, it can't be a Ram it can't be just a Ramco, it can't be just the big companies that are existing now. It's the companies that aren't yet created that will be the seeds that will grow into fifty billion dollar companies. And I think it's gonna be a long road for realization for that. Uh, but I think that uh, I think eventually it will happen. It's a, it's a very it's a very difficult situation, and again, it's a situation that China faced. Many other countries, many other regions have faced it. But I believe that there is still um, at the core of the Arab people uh, a sense of entrepreneurialism that goes back hundreds, if not thousands, of years. And um, but I do think it will take government support, and it will take um, Aramco, it will take everybody else who has a stake in building new businesses to do that. If I were Aramco, and I think they're doing this, I'd be investing in all forms of green energy, and I'd be looking to build entrepreneurial um, seeds all over the place so that I could harvest what, what comes from it. So, you know, get, I, I think that we're still early in the game. We're still very early in the game. I don't know if I answered your question, but... Yeah, sir, could I just add one, uh, one thought to that? Sure. In the, in the proposal that I briefly described, uh, individuals, banks, and foundations would act as uh, angel funders for uh, young people who would be selected through a rather rigorous process. They would also be mentored and monitored in their process. So it is a kind of start small and build idea, but it ha would have, in our concept, a high reliability for the people who are involved. So I do think the potential is there, but I also think you ask a perfect question. Thank you. Yeah, and, and by the way, there is a great, I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, obviously, I still do. There's an enormous interest in um, entrepreneurialism 